Psalm 29. Praise to God in his holiness and majesty. A Psalm of David. Give unto the Lord, O you mighty ones. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord is over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. Yes, the Lord splinters the cedars of Lebanon. He makes them into makes them like skip like a lamb. He makes them also skip like a lamb. Lebanon, Lebanon and Syrian, uh, Syrian, like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord divides the flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth and strips the forest bare. And his temples, everyone says, glory. The Lord sat enthroned at the flood, and the Lord sits at as king forever. The Lord will give strength to his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. I'm smiling because this is what I'm opening with today. It's like, okay. (laughs) Just catch my breath here for a second. (sighs) Okay. After Bible study last Thursday, um, four of us went out to Shiner's to have pizza. And it was Tom and Tom and Rick and myself. And we just started talking about just things in general, like how did you come to Christ? And it's always good to do that. And uh, we also talked about all the evidence that everything that's in the Bible is true. And we started talking about Mount St. Helens. And the crazy thing about Mount St. Helens in my life is that it keeps coming into my life one way or another. So... Yesterday, the 18th, was the 44th anniversary of it blowing, which was, back then, a month and a half before Lyndon and I got married. So it blew a month and a half before, and of course, all the subsequent fallout and everything. So that was the talk of the whole thing. So like, you know, I'm getting married, oh my gosh, and like, you know, and then, you know, this this volcano erupts. So... Little did we know that 15 years after it blew, around 1995-ish, we moved to Washington State, and we lived 32 miles from the crater. So everyone, like, you know, it was just like the JFK shooting. It's like, where were you when 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 the mountain blew? And, like, everyone knew the exact story, where it was, and it was just, it was amazing. And then we wound up going there and seeing the devastation. And um, it looked like a a lunar landscape. And you could spot herds of elk from a high bluff, probably five miles away. It's like, look, there they are. And like, you know, without even now, uh, when we took our grandkids there, probably, I don't know, about 10, 15 years ago, all that has grown back in. So, you know, like going like, huh, that's sad because you didn't see how horrible it looked before him. But it keeps popping into my life. (laughs) And here's why right now. So 44 years ago, yesterday, Mount St. Helens erupted before our eyes. Just as with many things these days, the war on truth rages on. Most adults over the age of 50 recall the eruption of Mount St. Helens on May 18th, 1980. This 9,600-foot cone-shaped volcanic mountain located in the state of Washington, exploded with power that shocked the world and made global headlines. And just a dog ear right this. It was a small mountain, and it was a small eruption, as things go. Even in the Cascades that go down in Southern uh, California, no, uh, Northern California, there's um, Crater Lake. And um, it's a mountain that was huge compared to Mount St. Helens, and it blew with such veracity that it's gone, and there's just a crater right there. So just keep that in mind. Mount St. Helens was not, it was spectacular, but it was nothing compared to others that have gone through it. So the initial blast of steam, which was equivalent to 20 million tons of TNT, the total energy output during the subsequent nine-hour eruption was equivalent to 440 million tons of TNT, approximately 33,000 Hiroshima atomic bombs. And 
With that going off, within moments after the natural um, eruption, the whole northern side of the mountain, which was two thirds of a cubic mile of rock slid away, the largest observed landslide on record. 57 people died, 7,000 big game animals died, millions of salmon, birds, small mammals died, and over $1 billion worth of property was destroyed, and over 230 square miles of forest was immediately flattened. Okay, so um, the... uh, the ash cloud stem itself was 10 miles high. The mushroom top was 40 miles wide and 15 miles high. The winds dispersed the ash eastward for at 60 miles per hour, blanketing 11 states, several Canadian provinces uh, with dust, and some towns were engulfed in complete darkness at midday. So, a great question to ask. Since the eruption of Mount St. Helens in 1980, what have we learned about rapid climate cooling, accuracy of carbon dating technologies, origins of coal beds and multi-layered forests, and the accumulation of rock canyon sediments? Geologists were astounded. And in 1980, the eruption provided a rare opportunity for scientists to study natural catastrophic process at work. Within a few months, It produced changes that scientists assumed required many thousands, even millions of years, and the environment returned to full health in just a few few, um, years, not decades or centuries. Indeed, the eruption and its aftermath challenged and still challenges the general assumption of Darwinian evolutionary interpretation and uh, of slow and gradual thousands and even millions of years accumulated of sediment, carbon dating, and the erosion of landscapes and the recovery of environments. Geologists who are accustomed to thinking about slow, uniformitarian evolutionary process shaping of our world were astonished by the scale of initial destruction and the speed which the new geologic features formed. But did you hear one word about this at any of the anniversaries or when they discovered this stuff? And have you ever heard anything about or even question the established scientific point of view for the major media outlets or academia or scientific community. No. And uh, why not? Well, the connection to the biblical flood. All science operates under the philosophy of doctrine called scientific neutralism, which is based on a non-scientific assumption that God was always absent from the realm of nature. We've allowed science and academia and other media to remove God from any of the priori discussion of nature and science. The eruption of Mount St. Helens uh, actually can teach us a lesson about the powerful forces that God, as creator, used to shape the earth. These findings confront the underlying assumptions of modern geo geologic thinking and give us invaluable clues about the catastrophic potential of the global biblical flood. From Genesis chapter 7, 11 through 12, in the 600th year of Noah's life, and I'm complaining about 60, okay. <laughs> on the 17th day of the second month, on that day, all the springs of the great deep burst forth, burst forth, and the floodgates of the heavens were opened, and rain fell on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. The flood was associated with the release of large volumes of water, possibly through large fissures in the ground or in the seafloor, and see the Mid-Atlantic Ridge in an article that they did about that. And the waters that had been uh, held back burst forth with the catastrophic consequences. There are many volcanic rocks interspersed between the fossil layers in the global rock record, layers that were deposited during Noah's flood. So it's quite plausible that these fountains of the great deep involved a series of volcanic eruptions with prodigious amounts of water bursting up through the ground. Similarly, at Mount St. Helens, most of the destructive carving of the surrounding land forming deep canyons was the result of water displacement. Spirit Lake, the ice melting of, uh, with lava and mud flows, and... Um, there were a lot of other key findings about the eruptions of Mount, Mount St. Helen, and here are four key scientific findings. One, the ash cloud and rapid cooling. Mount St. Helens blasted enough ash into the atmosphere to blanket multiple states and cool the earth a fraction of one degree. 
The Earth's rock layers show abundant evidence of huge numbers of massive volcanic eruptions through the closing stage of the flood and the years immediately following the flood. Those eruptions dwarfed the eruption of Mount St. Helens, so it is comparatively small. Mount St. Helens eruption could cool the Earth even by one degree. It is easy to see how multiple volcanic eruptions uh, contributed to the rapid onset of the Ice Age. Two, lava rock with old radiometric dates. Post-eruption rock studies revealed the fallibility of scientific radiometric dating methods. A 10-year-old rock sample from Mount St. Helens' last lava flow was dated at 350,000 years old. Using the uh, potassium argon method, uh, minerals inside were dated up to 2.4 million years old. These reports are consistent with many reports about faulty radiometric dating samples around the world. Radiometric, radiometric dating methods have been unquestioned by an unknowing public but are fraught with dis difficulties due to faulty assumptions. Three, rapid cool and petrified forests. The eruption destroyed the surrounding forest and produced a mat of logs floating in nearby Spirit Lake. Douglas firs as tall as 200 feet were instantly stripped of their branches and snapped like toothpicks. The logs jostled together and lost their bark, producing a pile of peat, like peat in coal. Many logs floated upright and then sank in layers like the petrified forest. Geologists have typically assumed that upright buried logs represent multiple forests that grew at different periods over thousands, even millions of years. It's now, it, it's, ha it's how scientists interpret this as the specimen ridge in Yellowstone National Park. Similarly, secular scientists believe that coal beds from very slowly accumulating organic material in swamplands where plants grew in place 1,000 years from the end of uh, to form one inch of coal. Spirit Lake at Mount St. Helens shows that coal beds can, can and do form rapidly due to catastrophic destruction of forests, not slow plant growth in swamps. The flood would have destroyed Earth's forest in a matter of weeks, and the floating logs would produce bark that then sank to form, the mo uh, form most of the Earth's coal layers. Four, rapid sedimentary layers. The eruption of Mount St. Helens triggered a different uh, several different earth-shaping forces. The original blast was uh, followed by landslides, steam, water mud flows, and falling ash. Even the water in nearby Spirit Lake was temporarily pushed out of its basin and then came crashing back into place. These catastro catast catastrophes uh, produced complex sediment layers up to 600 feet thick. Several slurries of volcanic ash produced many different fine layers in just minutes. Mount St. Helen teaches us that sedentary uh, layering does form very rapidly by catastrophic flow processes such as those which occurred during the Genesis flood. What is truth? If one accepts all that established sources tell us to believe, one may be blithely and woefully uninformed. This applies to all fronts of information, science, religion, health, history, etc. Real truth is being challenged. Discernment has to be worked out and explored. As we see just in the cited example of Mount St. Helens, the opinions of conventional geologists and scientists are debatable and at times dubious. Wisdom digs deeper and evaluates all sources of data and factors in bias and even censorship. And just to let you know, when I was looking to find this article, because I knew it was out here, uh, I'm just about done, but um, it, it's, it's weird. I, Mount St. Helens, proof of the flood. I had to go down six scrolling screens to get to anything that had to. All of it was like... What has it proved? Nothing. And, and these are like supposedly Christian sites. I'm like going like, okay, so you're a fraud in not only your name, but also what you're telling us. Okay, I get it. So just going through. But it's like if, if truth is that fragile for some people and you can't hear what somebody else has to say, that's when you know that they are just like grasping at straws right there. So as we know, especially here at the Superior Word, the Bible consistently holds up well under scrutiny. 
And in the case of Mount St. Helens, even in our own lifetime, we're witnessing the powerful forces of nature that supported what the Bible has told us all along. Is the Bible consistent with natural scientific phenomena? Absolutely. And this guy nailed it, let me tell you. So worth a look finding it, but um, Mount St. Helens, you know, I, I, I must have dragged my family members there a zillion times and just to see it, and I almost became like a, uh, uh, I don't know, like a armchair volcanologist <laughs> while I was there. It's like, you know, yes, that was a uh, paraclastic flow. That's the type of... <laughs> Kind of scary stuff. But anyhow, I'm glad that it popped its way into my life yet again. Here it is, 44 years after uh, it happened and uh, 44 years after Linda and I got married. And it's still talking to me in flat Florida. (laughs) Anyhow, Lord Jesus, thank you, Lord, for for just um, having uh, your witness to us of how powerful you are and what you did and proof that we can all look at, which is recent history, which blows a hole in everything that, that science that is so desperate to eliminate you in the process of things um, just falls flat in our face. And Lord, um, it just gives people joy to know that what you're saying in all pages of your book is, uh, is very true and provable. And Lord, um, with all that, we um, should have that much more firm faith in our salvation and what you have promised us after we um, leave this mess. But before we leave, may we just tell somebody else about you as Lord and Savior, and uh, may that um, increase every day. And Lord, uh, may um, we also um, pray for those that are not well, and we'll hear of more when Charlie gets up here. And um, we all know people in our own lives, and we should pray that they, uh, one, know Jesus is their Lord and Savior, and if they don't, we should pray that they come to that saving grace during their uh, troubles here. And um, let's do that today. We pray this in your son's holy name, Jesus. Amen. Amen.